It's an obvious fact that the surface of our planet is predominantly covered by water. Oceans and seas occupy 70% of the globe. But what if the shape of the seas would be marked differently? Imagine a world in which the seas are the countries, with their own boundaries, inhabitants, and flow of migrants. This is the Baltic Sea, comparatively small and shallow. From all sides surrounded by economically active countries, it is under huge impact of human activity, such as fishing, construction, as well as movement within the coastline. Every moment, there are roughly 2,000 ships in the Baltic, a part of them transporting 50 million passengers per month, a fifth of them being tankers, and most of them, cargo ships. They deliver us almost everything, what we buy, eat, consume, and trade. More than 15% of the world's cargo ships navigate through the Baltic Sea, making it one of the busiest maritime sea transits on Earth. Ports are similar to cities, having their own traffic, participants, and also hitchhikers. People residing around the Baltic coast love spending time near or on the water. Many travel from port to port with their yachts and sailboats, often going into wider waters to other seas. One of those other people is the experienced Finnish sailor and sea lover, Tapio Lettinen. I started actually the same year when this boat was built, 1965, when I was, uh, when I was seven years old. I think I, I fell in love with sailing uh, pretty much from the first time I, I sailed on my own. And uh, I think it has, has to do with the il illusion of freedom. For a sailor, freedom is the feeling that you are part of the sea and that the horizon has no end. However, whenever outside of the Baltic Sea, Tapio is reminded how isolated and small it actually is. One day I was calculating just by myself that, that uh, the, the amount of water there is in the Atlantic between two islands of, of the Azores, which I could see at the same time. The volume of the water there is bigger than the volume of the water in the whole of Gulf of Finland. And, and that, that makes you realize that, that how, how vulnerable this sea is. The fragility of the sea lies in the extent to which human activity affects it. Pollution in the form of waste or emissions is only part of the problem. In the sea, a number of species are traveling within the larger ship's ballast waters or cling to smaller ship hulls. Each sea has its own distinctive inhabitants, and thanks to their navigation, they move at an unprecedented speed and scale. The first ones to face the uninvited travelers are the sailors. Tapio experienced this in the prestigious Golden Globe race, when due to small marine organisms, he was forced to refuse from winning the prize. Barnacles, which had been clinging to the underside of his yacht, slowed down his movement. The most uh, dangerous situation I had during the race was due to uh, the boat having uh, painted with uh, uh, anti-fouling paint uh, meant for the Baltic Sea, which wasn't uh, strong enough for the Atlantic. And, and against the gooseneck barnacles, and that ended up uh, uh, with me having two to three thousand of this length uh, uh, barnacles hanging from the bottom of the boat, which, which uh, were a, a very effective handbrake slowing me down. It was possible to clean the settlement of the fouling organisms only by sailing to shore for dry dock cleaning, or manually by diving underwater. In the case of Tapio, none of these variants was an option. Removing them only by swimming with improvised tools, uh, I think it would have taken me a couple of weeks of time, and, and uh, there was never that long periods of, of calm weather. And, and the, I tried to do it once after passing New Zealand uh, on a calm day, but, but when I was putting my, my ladder into the water, 
and tying it to the to the side of the boat next to the mast the, there was a huge head of a shark which came visible from under the boat and, and I pulled up my ladder and and, my, and then the uh, uh, three to four meter long shark was swimming around the boat maybe a dozen times so it was quite easy to make a decision that I, I didn't uh, go into the water that day. The rest of the regatta course would now turn into a relaxed journey on the sea. The main goal now was just to reach the finish line in France. Making up for lost time was no longer a possibility. Since realizing the problem with, with the barnacles in Tasmania, it took me still five more months to, to reach, uh, reach France, which was uh, two, two and a half or three months more than what was the original plan. The winner of the race, uh, uh, Jean-Luc van der Heide, he, he finished almost, almost three months before me. <laughs> In France, Tapio was able to clean his yacht before it returned back to the Baltic waters, thus avoiding bringing the barnacles back to the Baltic Sea. If these steps are not taken, it becomes a threat to the Baltic's ecosystem. Many sailors, for this reason, treat their boats with rather strong anti-fouling paint, However, the stronger the paint, the higher the toxicity. The Baltic is a shallow sea and sensitive to such products, so it can be the death to much of its sea life. Therefore, steps are taken to control the strength of the paint. Right now, uh, the ship owners uh, see from their performance data that they uh, have an increased uh, fuel consumption and then decide to go for a hull cleaning which means uh, in-water cleaning when uh, either divers or remotely operated uh, um, machines or vehicles uh, clean the hull from this biofouling. And uh, that process or uh, yeah, that, uh, that um, way of cleaning is not uh, optimized uh, today. So that is what we are targeting, to optimize the cleaning. Uh, we are looking for optimizing it both considering the frequency for cleaning, the time intervals, uh, as well as the force that is used within the cleaning to remove the biofouling, uh, but at the same time not damage the anti-fouling paint. In order to understand the strength of the paint and intensity of cleaning required in each case, scientists in Gothenburg for a year have been conducting an experiment. They placed underwater slabs in the port, imitating the hull of the ship, treated with various anti-fouling paints. And they were caught, coated in the shipyard here in Gothenburg. I asked, uh, and they are made of steel, the same steel as the ships they repair there, six millimeter thick. Within a month, you already see some growth on it, even where it was cleaned. Every month, on a given day, the scientists remove the slabs and wash them using special equipment, thus finding the necessary cleaning force which is gentle to the hull of the ship, yet effective enough for removing fouling organisms. And we start with a lower flow rate, adjust it here, and now it's running. So as you see, the, the lower flow rate still hasn't removed everything from the panel. You still see a biofilm that is still staying there. So I need to step up to a higher force, increasing the flow rate. For hours, armed with patience, Dennis is doing this work regardless of whether in winter or summer. The clean slabs are placed in the water again and again to control what kind of sea organism fouling returns and to measure its growth. These two will be cleaned. This one is very interesting because the areas that have been cleaned, that is this part and this part, they are free of hard fouling and in the middle you have barnacles. So you could avoid those barnacles in the areas that have been cleaned. Finding the right anti-fouling paint and the optimal way of cleaning is a prevalent issue for the sailors. Sailors do not think much about the fact that their yachts can become a vehicle for alien species. It seems as if speed loss and fuel consumption can outweigh their concerns of toxic paints and the environment. 
есть, да, это большая проблема, что яхта, особенно когда она стоит в реке, то она очень быстро обрастает в течение там, двух недель где-то. Да, если вот, например, не, эта лодка не была бы покрыта, то через месяц я бы, так сказать, ну, это было бы там, скорость уменьшилась бы как минимум процентов на 15. We are painting them after two years. Someone is painting every year. We are painting after three years, for example. Uh, what to do with the species? We can't uh, just execute them. <laughs> it's not possible. The idea that there is nothing we can do with newcoming species transferred by hull fouling is a common but mistaken belief. You can restrict the migration of these species. Often exactly the smallest and the most unnoticed ones cause the greatest harm. Newcoming species adapt better to life under new conditions. They are less demanding and quickly conquer their place in the ecosystem, leading to the fact that the native species are literally being eaten from their dwelling. In order to understand what conditions and which marinas these species are able to survive in, researchers are taking samples, measuring and analyzing them carefully. To be able to differentiate between native and alien species of the Baltic Sea, one can only do this research in the laboratory. Izmēru grupās, frakcijās paraugi, šī ir smalkākā. Tā vienkārši ir jāpārskatās, vai tur kaut kas ir, vai, vai, vai vars arī nav. Ja ir kāds dzīves organismas, tad mēs to izlasīsim ārā. Nākamā frakcija ir, kas ir vairāk ar detrītu, dažādiem kukaiņiem un vežveidīgajiem. Šī ir, teiksim, tāda lielākā frakcija, kurā pārsvarā ir izskalotas tikai jūra zīles un dreisenas. The varied zebra mussel is found in the Caspian and Black Seas. In Europe, it has been spreading since the 19th century, by channels and rivers connecting from the drainage basins of the Caspian and Baltic Sea. It is characterized by the ability to produce an enormous number of larvae, up to 1.6 million, which freely float in water during the first months, but when entering a new place, rapidly start prevailing over the native shellfish species. Larvae and adult specimens are transferred both by ballast waters and by attaching themselves to boats and fishing gear. If the biggest harm of the barnacles and the zebra mussel is the dense fouling they form, then other newcomers are able to bring something much more dangerous, for example, parasites from crabs. Un tad, ja cilvēki lieto pārtikā šos skrābjus, tad ir iespējams ar šo parazītu inficēties. The Chinese mitten crabs have entered the Baltic Sea from the North Sea and have been now included into the list of invasive species, which means that their impact on the local ecosystem has turned so strong that the population of these crabs must be combated. Their birthplace is the Yellow Sea, but since their first migration within the ballast waters into Europe, they are taking over the Baltic Sea increasingly faster. Šiem krabiem ir ļoti liels spējs pārvarēt lielus attālumus. Tie gar jūras krastu spēj pārvarēt līdz pat tūkstotus vai divi tūkstoši kilometrus. Pie mums atrodamie krabi, kas ir lūk 2019. gadā, 2018. un pat šajā gadā atrastie krabi, tiek uzskatīti visi kā ienācēji no kaimiņu valstīm. For the time being, these crabs can only reproduce in the North Sea because of the salinity of the water, but they move so quickly that they are expanding their place in the Baltic Sea, bringing alongside other alien species, such as the previously mentioned barnacles. Jūra zīlēm ir attīstības cikls, kad nosēžoties pēc planktoniskās stadijas, tām ir vajadzīgs ciet svirsmas. Un ja krābi ļoti lielā koncentrācijā, kāds, piemēram, varētu būt Ziemeļjūrā vai Baltijas jūrā pie Vācijas krastiem, tad jūras zīles, nosēžoties uz grūnti, sastop pašus krābjus. 
tātad cietā virsma un tāpēc tās pieķeras. Un līdz ar to šis ir viens no tādiem momentiem, kad varbūt tās arī, ja jūras zīles nav sastopamas kādā vienā konkrētā vidē, krābi sveicot šo lielo attālumu, tie ir tūkstoši vai divi tūkstoši kilometri, nokļūst citā vidē, nu, pieņemsim šajā gadījumā Rīgas līcī, jūras zīle vēl ir dzīvot spējīga, un tai tātad parādās jaunā paaudze. Tas nozīmē, ka šī te cita suga, kas pirms tam nebija atrodama pie mums, varētu tikt ieviest arī šādā veidā. In a similar way as the Chinese mitten crab carries barnacles on its back, ship hall fowling transports crab babies or smaller crab-like species from country to country. For example, small mud crabs, which have been widely present in Estonia and Finland, are now found in Latvian ports more and more. It is possible to witness the presence of the newcomers only after the fishing season is finished, when sailors bring their yachts for dry dock cleaning before winter. It is easier to judge what exactly was attached in different ports during the season if researchers are participating and collecting the fouling samples. The presence of some particular newcoming species in the Baltic Sea may be confirmed only on particular voyages. One of these new species is a shrimp that has arrived here very recently. Its uh, common name is killer shrimp and uh, it doesn't kill humans or anything like that, nothing to worry about there, <laughs> but it kills a lot of the animals that it then doesn't feed on and so it kills a lot of its own kind and animals that live in the kind of habitat that you'd find it. So we're going to go over now to look at a stony area to see if we can find this killer shrimp. You need to be quite careful how you identify them because the one that we're particularly interested in is called Dicorogamorus velosus, which comes from originally the Black Sea, and it moved up the Danube. And when the main canal uh, was opened up, it then came down to the, uh, the Rhine and then along the canal system, which is quite close to the coast. So we have it in the Vistula River, and recently we found it in the Southern Baltic. Mm -hmm. In Kaliningrad, it was found in 2013, 2015 in Lithuania, and then uh, last year we found it in Latvia. Even the most experienced expert sometimes is not able to visually determine which species is a newcomer and which one is native. Therefore, it is required to do genetic testing, which will identify it based on the DNA. Such methods are often used for distinguishing between two visually similar species. Researchers can also take a so-called water fingerprint, which records the information about the microorganisms. Each species has the specific uh, barcode, this small DNA sequence that calls barcode. Uh, and we just amplify this uh, fragment and sequence it, and we can know that there is one species or another species. With such DNA research, new species can be detected at the moment when a newcomer is still in the larvae stage. It is like finding letters, then creating words, and then searching which ones are already on your list. In this case, the database of new species. We do not need to catch the entire organism. We just uh, catch the DNA that the organisms left in the environment. They release DNA together with uh, uh, fragments of skin, uh, with uh, germ, with feces, and uh, with hairs, and so on, with scales. Uh, and we can catch this DNA and extract from the sample all this uh, environmental DNA and sequence them with special methods, uh, uh, DNA metabarcoding methods, and uh, this method gives us the data of all biodiversity in the sample. We can know each species what is in that sample. The DNA fingerprints may stay in the water for up to two weeks, so it's important to know where and what to search for. For example, Poland, which has an entrance gate to the Baltic Sea for many alien species, has chosen four very different places to search for migrating species. If the West is dominated by newcomers from the German waters, then the most interesting place for research would be to the east, in the lagoons near Kaliningrad. There are many boats coming from Russia. 
uh, and we think that maybe we can find more Pontocaspian species in this area. But uh, the second marina, uh, which is located in the river mouth, uh, when the uh, salinity is changing, uh, is also perfect, I think, environment for the uh, non-native species because there are the many different habitats. It's, there are more freshwater parts, more saline parts, but also a lot of shelters. Uh, and the uh, Gulf of Gdansk is more open. We have a lot of visitors there from Germany, from Scandinavia. So we also think that maybe uh, they can take some uh, non-indigenous species from us to their countries. The hitchhikers travel so quickly and extensively that in order to capture the moment of their appearance, a separate database is needed to be created. The data is delivered to those who are closest to the sea, fishermen, sailors, and of course, the scientists. In the Baltic Sea, we have uh, Aquanese database, which is, um, I would say, one of the most known databases uh, on the invasive species. Uh, and then we enter information uh, where it is found, who found it, uh, which salinity is uh, in that kind of space that is found in that location, and a lot of other information. And also uh, the person uh, who enters the data, he sometimes he finds information about the impact that could have this species and the impacts could be very wide from the impact to human health to environment to economy and so on over the past few years more than 15 new species have been found in the baltic sea overall more than 180. the aquanus database also contains information on more than 10,000 species occurring in 3,000 ports outside of the Baltic Sea. This tool is very useful in seeking answers not only to the question of which species travels where, but also how much harm a particular newcomer could bring. The database and the studies on behavior of these particular species are the basis for an early warning system to be introduced to the Baltic Sea. If, for example, in Port of Klaipeda we'll find something and we, we need, uh, as soon as possible, uh, uh, inform Riga ports or Stockholm port or, or, or Helsinki or Kiel what look we have a problem here so uh, for that purpose we developed uh, the early warning system on findings of these halps harmful aquatic organisms and pathogens we developed a special functional block which now informs all the interested parties about the findings of such species and information goes from our partners all around the Baltic Sea to this system. And also during the project, we find out who is responsible in each country around the Baltic Sea for detection of such species. What institutions? In Sweden, in Finland, in Latvia, in Lithuania, in Poland. Okay, and then uh, if something is found, who has rights to send the warning system, uh, signal? And there it goes. So we uh, clarify this information canal, so to say. This system would help to react faster and to send information to those who need it the most. It is necessary for such regional seas as the Baltic Sea. Moreover, it would be perfectly useful for large vessels to regulate the time and place where ballast water should or should not be refilled, which is the way of distributing new species which is as significant as bringing them by ship hull fouling. It's really important to uh, stop the, or prevent the spread of invasive species because uh, they are a huge threat to the natural biodiversity in the Baltic Sea. And a complete project is, is working uh, towards minimizing the risk of their spread uh, addressing both uh, the ballast water and uh, biofouling of, of ships. So we are working on both these fields and in addition we are also working with monitoring issues. So the, these three combined uh, will help us uh, preventing their further spread. At the moment, biofouling management is not regulated. 
That is why many activities around the Baltic coast are carried out to create a harmonized system that will ensure consistent management practices throughout the region. The first step is to harmonize monitoring of the non-native species. Well, we have been lacking uh, certain habitats that are not monitored and in complete we have been uh, filling in these gaps. Based on the monitoring samples we will then know uh, what areas are the hotspots, so where we get uh, most of the species introduced and also we can assess if they are established there in the, in the ecosystem or if they are just like once uh, uh, found and then not later at all and also uh, maybe to assess uh, what impacts they may have in the ecosystem. What can be done? The sea, although relatively small, can have different conditions and situations. What works for the south of the Baltic Sea does not necessarily work for the north. The same principles could also be related to recommendations to be set out for yacht handling. In the Baltic Sea, we have this salinity differences, for example, and we have different biofouling pressure in the north compared to the south. So that in the north, we sometimes we have uh, the situation that ships use much more biocides in their antifoulings than they would use because the fouling pressure is not that high. Our aim is to look for individual solutions. Being united in the search of common but individual solutions is a big challenge. That is why precision has become a guiding principle for catching the Baltic Sea hitchhikers. Both in terms of their detection in water samples by new and accurate methods and developing an alert system with recommendations to ship owners. By implementing all these principles, it is possible to restrict migration of new species into the Baltic Sea, keeping it clean, healthy and unique.